。那就是我非常谢谢苏一林小哥那个他赞助我的活动。那而且他更更好的是，他们还请到三位女生来做演讲。那十二月还有一次，对，所以谢谢他们，我们拍手一下。Hi, this is too loud. Okay, hi there. Hi. So I'm Christine Lee. I'm a breast cancer surgeon that's Swedish and primarily Swedish Isakwa. And I've got a couple of my colleagues with me here today.、Um, Dr. Ben Shi, who's one of our medical oncologists at Swedish and through the Cancer Institute,、uh, primarily practicing in Isakwa. And Dr. Alec Eric Valier, who is a specialty lung cancer surgeon and heads of the thoracic program through the Cancer Institute. So, firstly, I'd like to say happy birthday. I think it's a birthday <laughs> day, isn't it? <laughs> But thank you very much for having us. We feel very honored to be here.、Um, Dr. Shi is unique for me because he can、uh, interpret for me if there's、um, and translate for me a little bit since he's fluent in. Most of our language switch, I think, is very nice. He's not fluent necessarily in female male language differences, <laughs> but English and Chinese, maybe. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Okay. So、uh, this is really just a quick talk about breast cancer and things that you can potentially do to decrease your risk. And to increase、uh, the chance that you'll identify it if you have it, and that we can get it taken care of easily. So we're going to talk a little bit about just statistics, facts, and figures. We're going to talk about risk factors for breast cancer in general, and we're going to talk about some things that are specific to Asian Americans. We're going to talk a little bit about family history, which people often know is associated with breast cancer. We're going to talk a little bit about the best screening for breast cancer, and we'll talk a little bit about watching for signs and symptoms. So this is a slide that I think you'll see again today. But basically, all it tells us is that the risk of cancer is different incidence in men and women in the U.S. with、uh, prostate cancer being the most common cancer in males. And breast cancer being the most common cancer in females, it is not the leading killer in females. However, because breast cancer tends not to be lethal in most cases, and so it is only the second cause of death from cancer in women in the U.S. And we'll learn more about lung cancer. And lung cancer, you'll notice, is flipped on this slide. It's less common, but it's more deadly. The reason why it's less deadly is that over the past many years, survival from breast cancer has actually improved dramatically. And these these days, over 90% of women in North America will survive their breast cancer. So the numbers are staggering. However, one in eight women in North America will get a breast cancer. Now, Asian American women slightly lower. But it's on the rise, unfortunately. Breast cancer is again the most common cancer in American women, behind skin cancer, which is really the most common cancer in anybody. But it's、um, but it's not considered、uh, as part of these for the most part because much of those are just small skin lesions that can be excised. It is a very common problem. It's estimated that this year, 266,000 women plus will be diagnosed with an invasive breast cancer in the U.S., and another 63,000 will be diagnosed with non-invasive breast cancer, or the pre-invasive form of breast cancer that we also do recommend treating. Uh, 40,000 women, unfortunately, will die from breast cancer in the U.S. this year. Now that number, importantly, has been decreasing for、um, non-Hispanic white women in the U.S. <coughs> since 1989, and those decreases are thought to be the result of better treatment, earlier detection, and increased awareness about cancer. Because of that, we have a lot of survivors, and over three and a half million women in the U.S. today live with a history of breast cancer. Or currently have breast cancer in treatment, so it's a very large number of women. This is why I think it should matter here today. If you look at these, I don't expect you to be able to see all of these small numbers, but what this tells us is that in the Chinese population, 
in the U.S., the trend, which is the blue line, has been going steadily, slowly up for the last 15 years. And that's in contrast to U.S. white women where it has been going down. Okay? And so I think it's even more, thank you, I think it's even more important for you all to be aware of it as it's somewhat of a new problem. Why do we get breast cancer? And this is a question that I can't answer in full. No one can. But we know that a normal cell turns into a cancer cell when it's injured at the level of the cell within the DNA, which is really the brain of the cell and what makes the cell function. There are things in our genetics, like genetic mutations that change our DNA, but then there's things that we do in our lifetime that hinder our DNA's ability to fix itself once it is injured and that injure it further. And so it's a combination of those things that most likely lead to the majority of cases of all cancer, actually. So again, I don't expect you to be able to read all of the fine print. But what this tells us is these are the causes of breast cancer that we, can, that we cannot change, okay? I can't really change very easily that I'm a woman. I can't change that I'm going to age, I hope, over time. And I can't change the genes that I was born in or the family that I was born in or some other very specific things about myself, okay? I can change a lot of other things, however, that impact my risk of breast cancer. For example, I can not take hormone replacement therapy after menopause, which is increases the risk of breast cancer relatively significantly, especially if you take it for more than two years. And there are other things that we'll talk about that I can change as well. This is just to show that of all the cancers that we describe here, in breast cancer, 30% of cases, a third of cases are due to those risks that we can change. So our behavior actually matters. And that is one of the reasons why it is felt that Asian Americans are seeing a higher risk in breast cancer over the last many years because bad habits have been adopted, unfortunately, in North America because we do have a lot of bad habits here. Specific to Asian populations in North America, there are things here that we can modify. Our weight, if we're careful about that. Again, not using hormone replacement treatment. Making sure that our vitamin D levels are okay, and this is something we can do with diet easily or with supplementation. These are omega fatty acids. And there are different ones in our diet. And if we use things like certain types of vegetable oils, we'll get the wrong kind. If we eat a lot of things like fish, flaxseed, and other types, we'll get the right kind. And so these are dietary changes that we can make. Alcohol. Too much alcohol is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. Any alcohol actually increases a woman's risk of breast cancer, but it is dose related, so a little bit is better than a lot. And diet, this is a big one, and actually a big one in Asian populations because of traditional ways of eating with high temperature cooking, things like high temperature frying, grilling that chars the food, and pickling, all of those things increase our risk of breast cancer, as well as high meat consumption. If I look at Asian populations specifically, the question is, why are the numbers typically lower than they are for white populations? And it's because traditionally, a lot of good things happen. There is a soy-based diet, which can be quite protective, a lot of green tea consumption, mushroom consumption, seaweed, other things that have been shown to be protective, and there is a favor for a more traditional vegetable, fruit, soy, 
poultry fish based diet that is much better than when we see a red meat heavy diet. Family history is not something that you can control, but it is really important to know about it. Know your family history when you can and share it with your family. It's very common I see people who do not know their family history because the last generation didn't talk about breast cancer. And so they don't have that information. So if we talk about it, we'll be able to carry that knowledge forward. And it's important for daughters and nieces and grandkids to have that information. But most women who get breast cancer actually don't have a family history. And most women don't have any gene mutation specifically. Okay, so this only applies to a small portion of the population, but populations who need to think about this more are folks that have families with early breast cancer. So if someone was diagnosed at 30 or 40, folks that have families that also have ovarian cancer in them, folks that have uh, people in the family who have had multiple cancers, Say they have a colon cancer and then later they get a breast cancer after they're cured for one. Those things matter. This is not a big issue typically in the Asian American population, but this is a specific type of Jewish ancestry. And if you have anybody in your family that has that, it's important. And then other things that can increase the risk that are not necessary to talk about in detail. Screening is really important. This is how we find breast cancers early, and this is how we cure them. Routine self-examination, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Getting in to see your doctor once a year for a full exam, and getting your breast imaging, which is primarily a mammogram, and we'll talk about that. If you're from a high-risk family, we recommend that you're evaluated by one of our high-risk nurses, and they will help you assess your risk, and then they can help you decrease your risk where it is appropriate. So breast cancer typically will show no signs or symptoms when it's at its earliest stage, and that's why getting in to get those mammograms is really important. There are things that you can see in your breast, and we'll go over those in a minute, but just remember, if you have any questions about what's go what are going on in your breast, you need to be evaluated by a physician. And don't put it off. There's no reason to wait. It's easier to go in and have them tell you it's okay than it is to worry about it at home. So screening recommendations have changed, but they still remain regular mammograms to start on or near the age of 40. Typically, we're doing them once a year, and most of the major cancer groups still recommend once a year. It is appropriate when you get a little older to do them every couple of years, but we still favor doing them once a year if you are able. And typically your insurance will cover that if you're insured. We are lucky in the state of Washington in that every woman can get a mammogram even if she doesn't have uh, insurance coverage through our breast cancer screening program. So never think that you can't get a mammogram. You can always get a mammogram you just you have, may have to find out how to get it done for you. Screening should continue as long as you're in good health. You don't have to stop screening for breast cancer at 70 if you're going to live to 100. It just depends on what your health is. So remember to pay attention to it. This is just an example of modern mammography. This is standard mammography, which was two-dimensional mammography. We are using up until a decade ago or so only. Now we have 3D mammography, and it helps us find things even smaller. Same patient, barely can see what's happening here within this dense breast tissue. 3D mammography stands out. There's a little lump there that you can see. Physical exam. You don't have to look for every tiny detail in your breast. We don't expect you to find a little BB necessarily. But if you're paying attention and you know what your breasts generally look and feel like, then something new will call its attention and you can pay attention to it. So we look for things like lumps, 
if your nipple is pulled back, if you have dimples in the skin that you didn't have before, if you have drainage from your nipple, especially if it's bloody, if you see things like redness or rash, and don't keep your mouth closed. If you notice your daughter or your cousin when you're changing in the exercise room, feel free to say, hey, have you noticed this? These, again, are things that we can do, things that we can do to change our risk of breast cancer. And most of you probably do a lot of these already. I saw there was a very well-attended exercise class in here this morning before we got started. That's really important. So know your family history so that if it's important, we can pay attention to it and do things differently. Maintain a healthy weight. The best way to do that is by a balanced diet and regular exercise. Exercise alone, even if you're overweight, decreases your risk of breast cancer. So keep active. Watch your vitamin D level, which is something that your primary care doctor can do for you easily. Minimize the amount of alcohol that you drink. Again, this is important. We used to give all women hormone replacement treatment when they went through menopause, thinking it was good for the heart, thinking it was good for the bones. We've learned not so good for the heart, and there's lots of other things we can do to protect the bones. Okay. In fact, good vitamin D, good calcium, regular exercise, probably one of the most important ways to protect the bones. And then remember to get screening. It's as simple as that. Please get you. Any questions at all that I can answer for anybody? I actually had a question. Why? What is the pickling? Interesting. So there are things in the food that gets pickled called nitrites. That um, it's the same as charred food and other foods. And so it is potentially, there are diets that have lar like a large amount of kimchi or a large amount of pickled foods where they see increases in very specific cancers like gastric cancer, stomach cancers, those sorts of things. And so those things can all make a difference in general cancer risk. Yes? I think a lot of the size actually too, yeah, yeah, the rest would be Yes. What does this have to Yes. So actually breastfeeding may be protective. So it is possible in, in some associations they've seen that if you breastfeed your children, you are slightly less likely to get breast cancer. Now, none of these things cure or prevent it by themselves, but as far as a general active, healthy lifestyle and controlling the things you can control, they are important. Yes, sir. In the past, I have heard conflicting information about soybean. Yeah. One say soybean is good, the other one says soybean is bad because it contains the bacteria similar to estrogen. Right, and that's a very, well, very good question. Right. Yeah, who's right, right? Yes. So the real answer is that there are still some controversy about that, but what we're learning actually is that it may be due to an individual's genetics and an individual's way that they process soy. So what we do know is that for everybody, a moderate around amount of soy in the diet is safe. For some people, a moderate amount or a high amount of soy in the diet may be protective against breast cancer. And actually, they demonstrated that in Asian populations, potentially because traditional soy-based diets actually led to some changes in the intestines in how we process soy. And so the byproducts, what soy does to your body once you've ingested it, and how it behaves once it's in your body, may be different in people who ethnically have had a large soy-based diet over time versus us white North Americans who just start putting soy in our lattes all the time. It's a different population. But on general, soy is safe for everybody. High soy diets may be protective in certain populations. So there's no reason to avoid soy in any population. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, sir. So there's one slide that I didn't include, which is all of the things that we have exposed ourselves to 
after the Industrial Revolution. So plastics, antibiotics in our food, hormones in our food, hormones that we don't even know are in our food. So when they study our fresh caught salmon in the Puget Sound, it is full of antidepressants, mm -hmm. antacids, mm -hmm. hormone metabolites from oral contraceptions that we pee out and go in the water, <laughs> right? So maybe our salmon are not depressed and they don't have heartburn <laughs> and they don't go through menopause, but they're also not very healthy to eat as we would want them to be when they're fresh caught. And all of those things are probably answer this mystery of why in addition to our individual genetics. So I think that's a very good point. In general, I tell everybody I know who's raising a young baby or making a baby inside of them, really avoid as much non-necessary exposures as possible. You mean just a mandatory area? No, actually we have studied it here, but it's seen all over. Yeah, it really depends on how far away the salmon are from where the water that we dispose of goes into the ocean, right? But these days, anywhere in the ocean, it's pretty hard to get away from human disposal, right? Unfortunately. Yes? About the soil. Yes. Um, is uh, organic soil uh, better than the... Uh, so that's a good question. It's difficult because the whole organic thing, unfortunately, in North America is not very well regulated. And so something can have a label that says organic and not be as organic as something else, which interestingly is different in Europe. They regulate it very heavily. But in general, you're better off with organic because you're most likely not to get some of these preservatives, antibiotics that were treated, fertilizers and pesticides in those other exposures. Uh, female hormones for postmenopausal women, their estrogen, their progesterone, mm -hmm. which is or both uh, bad for breast. Really both. Um, now we do, in certain populations, especially in an individual patient, if they are deemed to be at average or low risk, and they need those hormones to replace a specific deficit in their health, which some women do, okay? Some women have problems that they develop in their uterus or in other places where we might wanna use those hormones for a very short period of time, then that's okay. If you're treating something very specific and you've weighed the risks with your provider. But other than that, we really say, they should all be avoided after menopause. Yes? The um, annual menograph, as I mentioned, increase the risk of breast cancer. Really good, really good question, because you are getting radiation every time you get a mammogram. Um, what we have learned, though, we have really good data over a long period of time to actually show that your risk of getting a breast cancer from a mammogram is lower than your risk of having a bad outcome from a breast cancer that's not discovered. But that will change over time. We're hoping the radiation dose with each mammogram will trend. It's gone up a little bit in the last couple of years because of the transition to 3D that that will go down over time. And then figuring out exactly, should we do it every one year? Should we do it every two years? There's still some unanswered questions there. But very good questions. So but how about the effect of the uh, radiation? Would that be accumulated? It is, any radiation that we receive in our lifetime is cumulative. And we get radiation just in our environment. We get radiation from flying in airplanes across the world to visit our family, <laughs> especially if we do it a lot. There's a lot of radiation at 30,000 feet. So there's a lot of things that we, things like CAT scans that you might get when you go into the emergency room, okay? But all of the screening tools that we're doing right now are being dosed, and you'll hear about this in lung cancer, so that the dose of the radiation is as low as it can be, and that's only getting better over time because of technology. And so that is actually a very, very low risk compared to your risk of not getting those appropriate screening tools, okay? 
Uh, you mentioned uh, for the ladies in their 40s or 50s shall have a mammogram once a year. Yes. But as they grow old, uh, does the frequency need to be going down? No, we really would still recommend the same frequency, either once a year or once every two years. And that's a discussion between you and your doctor, really, depending on what your risk is and what your priorities are. But every one or two years, until you're really not well enough to tolerate treatment. Because these days, a lot of treatment for breast cancer is a very simple outpatient surgery like having a mole removed. And you can, I, I operated on two 90 year olds last week who um, had cancers that they needed to have treated and they're both doing terrifically well and will do well. But we're learning about who needs treatment in that age group over time as we study it more as our population ages. So the answer might change, but right now, keep getting mammograms. And I don't want to take all the time from my colleagues, so I think I should probably <laughs> stop there. So, Ben and I, we're, we're going to be talking about lung cancer, and we divided it. We're going to be talking about screening and potential prevention and risks. And then Ben will talk about symptoms and, and treatment. So this is what I'd like to cover is statistics, um, screening, lung cancer in non-smokers, which is, which is real, uh, gender differences, and then I think the, look, the future looks very promising, and I'll give you some examples of that. So statistics, this is a slide that Dr. Lee showed. Uh, lung cancer is the second most common uh, cancer in both men and women in the United States. Um, and the main reason for that is cigarette smoking. If there were no cigarettes in this world, I would have no job. <laughs> 85 to 90 percent of lung cancers in this country, in the world, are due to cigarette smoking. Okay? And we've known that since 1963. That's 50 years ago. And we still sell the product in our stores. We've known that for a long time. That's called human behavior. Okay, and this is why we have lung cancer as being such a big problem. Uh, there are over uh, 7,000 chemicals that smokers inhale when they smoke these cigarettes. And 70 of those chemicals have been shown in models to cause cancer. Every time you light up a cigarette, you're putting a cancer stick at your mouth. Now, we've known also that when you start smoking, as the population starts smoking, it'll take about 20 to 25 years before you start seeing cancer rise. And the same thing happens the other way. When you stop smoking, the population decreases, the it takes 20 to 25 years. And that's very well shown here. So the population starts smoking a little less here, 20 years later, the incidence is going down. That's the silver lining. It is going down. But as Dr. Lee said, it is the biggest cancer killer, both men and women, in North America, is lung cancer. And in fact, lung cancer every year will kill more Americans than the next four added together. So if you want to have an impact on the society, there is a target for you. Um, now, why is, oh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. Uh, this is what I was saying. Okay, now there is some silver lining in all of this, is that as a result of less smoking, you can see that this is male mortality from cancer, lung is red. You can see that as a result of less smoking, starting in the 70s, 25 years later, it's going down. Now. Ladies picked up the habit later, and later they start going up, and the good news is now it's starting to go down a little. However, if you look outside the buildings and you see the population that is walking out there to smoke, look outside the hospitals, uh, who is smoking out there? There's a lot of young women smoking out there. And they are heavily targeted by the tobacco industry, and unfortunately I think the tobacco industry is kind of winning that one right now. Now, why is it that it is the biggest cancer killer? It's because, unfortunately, only one patient in five, or 18%, will be alive five years after being diagnosed with lung cancer. Now, why is that? It's because, sorry, 
is because we pick it up too late. By the time we tell someone you have a lung cancer, it is almost more than half. It is already a high stage. It's a stage four. It's not like breast where you pick them up very early as a result of screaming and you, you pick them up here so a lot more are going to survive. So how are you going to improve those numbers in lung cancer? Well, either you're going to have a better treatment when you diagnose them that late or you're going to diagnose them earlier. And this is historically where we've diagnosed lung cancer at a very early stage with a very small number of patients because we did not have a good screening tool. Well, that's changed. There was a hint from a study that we at Swedish have been participating since the early 2000s that in fact, if you were to do annual low-dose CAT scans, CT screening, you would pick up a whole lot more of early stage cancer. In this study, 90% of the patients who were on that program, we diagnosed them as an earlier stage. Now, because a, before a society will adopt the tool, the screening tool, you need to show that screening a population will cure more, will decrease the mortality in that population. So we know that the test works in picking up early, but it took a while for us to understand and to show that, in fact, you will have less death from lung cancer if you were to screen a population at risk. And that's a study that was done in 20, uh, published in 2013. Very briefly, it was done in the U.S. Patients either had a low-dose CAT scan or a chest x-ray every year for three years. They enrolled over 50,000 patients. The population targeted were patients in these age group who had a smoking history of 30-pack years. And I'm going to skip the details of this, but it showed a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality in the group that had the low-dose CAT scan. And what that's meant is that finally we have our societies and, and the government, everyone has agreed that we now have a screening tool for lung cancer that is paid for, that is accepted. But not everyone can just walk in and get screened for lung cancer as the criteria are defined now. It is defined by the patients, the population that were studied, and these are the age groups, 55 to 77, either active smokers or ex-smokers within the last 15 years, more than a 30-pack year smoking history. What 30-pack year means is if you smoke one pack a day for 30 years or two packs a day for 15 years, you see how that goes up. Okay. There has to be no symptoms of cancer because once it's a symptom, it's not called screening anymore. It's a diagnostic CAT scan. And as Dr. Lee mentioned, you need to be able to tolerate treatment. If you're too ill and you're not going to be able to tolerate treatment, there's no point in screening. Now, there's some warnings about this. It's not every CAT scan is just a simple, it's done, where it's all over. In fact, you've got to be careful because one patient in four when you do a screening CAT scan, there'll be a nodule on your skin. So, whoa, that means everyone now goes, whoa, I have a nodule. Well, oh, sorry, did I go? But the majority of those nodules are not cancer. They are benign. In fact, if your CAT scan is positive, has a nodule, only 4% of the patients who have a nodule, it's actually a cancer. So the danger here is that everyone gets a CAT scan, they have a nodule, and then they have treatment, intervention, when actually they don't have cancer. So it's very important that if you embark on a lung cancer screening, it's part of a very well-structured, expert program. You cannot get your CAT scan in a shopping center, and that's the end of that. It's not the way it works. <laughs> it's a lot more complex. It needs to be done within a very well-structured uh, environment. And we've had this in Swedish now for almost 20 years. There's another study that um, was actually just uh, reported last month in Toronto from Europe, again showing exactly the same thing. Low-dose CAT scan is a very good screening tool. Now, I'll give you an example of why it's important not to go crazy because you have a nodule. This, if you show that to a lot of physicians, they would say, this looks like a lung cancer, not 100% of the time. It isn't. This is a mass that was picked up on a CAT scan, and then whoop, three months later, 
that's gone. It wasn't a cancer. So it's very important that whoever is monitoring and helping you after you've had your CAT scan knows what they're doing. So as I've said, we've been doing screening as part of research for almost 20 years at Swedish. Uh, and we basically have established a very well-structured um, uh, lung cancer screening program that's also associated with the tobacco-related uh, disease and tobacco cessation program now five years ago. And it's, this is the people that work. It's a big team, and it's a structured, and we follow algorithms and protocols so that not everyone that has a nodule ends up having an intervention or an operation. In fact, a very few patients need an operation. And these are the numbers that we've, uh, a patient we've screened over the years. This is almost uh, two years old already, but we are, we have the largest experience in the Northwest by far. So that was for screening in smokers or ex-smokers, but lung cancer does happen in non-smokers. Now, there are differences with the non-smoker's lung cancer. They are biologically a very different animal than a smoker's lung cancer. They're not, they don't look the same, and they don't behave the same. And genetically, when you start looking at the genes that make up the tumor, there's a lot more of a homogeneity. There's a lot more of, of constant messages being transmitted in the non-smoker's uh, lung cancer. And I don't know if you've heard about the targeted treatments, which are these pills that you can take to help you treat your cancer. The, the use of those pills, and I think Ben will talk about this, is a lot more uh, frequent and possible in non-smokers lung because the genetic alterations are more predictable. Now, there are about 5,000 Americans, never smokers, who die of lung cancer every year. It's not a small number. And why is that? Well, the main um, reason is because there are additional um, uh, uh, carcinogens that we're exposed to and risk factors, one of which is secondhand exposure. If you were raised in a household where your parents, I was, my parents smoked, yeah, it puts you at risk. Or if you work in an environment where everyone around, yes, it puts you at risk. Uh, but there are also other things we're exposed to, radon, which is in the, in the soil, and uh, you should have a radon measurement devices in your household to see whether there's a lot of radon uh, and put it in the basement. That's where most of I keep doing this, sorry. Um, air pollution. And this is where I'll come back to this, but this is definitely something that's now we're seeing that as one of the main reasons for non-smokers lung cancer. Uh, people who work in environments where they're not wearing protection, they're exposing themselves to, to chemicals and toxins. And there are the very odd patients with unfavorable mutations. That's, I call that bad luck. <laughs> in India, if you, pollution is in many of the large cities a major issue. If you look at the women who get lung cancer in India, 90% of them are never smokers. That's all driven by pollution. Cook. Yes. What kind of What's that? They're, they're most like, most of them are adenocarcinomas. So there are different types of cancers when you look at them under the microscope, and that's correct. In the non-smokers, most of them are adenocarcinomas. Now, this is a study that's not been published yet, but was reported in Toronto last month, looking at, this is here, this is the Northwest, this is Vancouver, Canada. And they were able to map out, because now we have the tools with satellite observations and ground measurements of particulates, of stuff that we breathe all the time. And they were able to do a mapping out of this and correlate it with non-smokers who have lung cancer. And this is what they found is that in women with lung cancer, outdoor air pollution exposure was significantly higher than never smokers. We're starting to have the tools and the measurements to prove and to show, yes, pollution drive things here. Be aware of that. Now, uh, there's also this idea about what about cooking in a closed environment with hot food. Yes, there is some data. I'm not an expert in the field, but there is. this is old. This is uh, already 13 years old. But there was a, a chapter in there saying there are many studies in China that have found that if you cook in a non-ventilated hot fumes, hot oil, it has been shown to increase the risk of lung cancer. The solution to that is better ventilation, better aeration, and so on. <coughs> Briefly, gender differences. 
Well, if you're going to be unlucky enough to have a lung cancer, you're better to be a woman. <laughs> and uh, this is um, incidence rates by race, ethnicity, uh, Asian Americans are here. So if you look at the uh, incidence, it's lower in women than it is in men. That's probably driven by tobacco use, I would suspect. But this is probably more interesting, what I'm going to show next. This is a study that I was, I was a participant in. It's a large study where we looked and compared so many things in between smokers, non-smokers, men and women. And one of the two of the conclusions are that female are markedly better survival that we cannot explain by anything except the fact that they were female. And that was just a, a reported in Toronto two weeks ago uh, at the big world lung meeting. So that's good news for the ladies in the room. <laughs> now, the numbers I've shown you are out of are, 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 are not good, but there is a good future, I think. Number one is there is definitely less tobacco being consumed. It's not as low as li I'd like it to be, uh, but it's better. And we're seeing here on the West Coast, what we see here is not the same as in the Midwest, no doubt, or Texas, or, but it's getting better. The alternatives, the, the vaping and all this stuff, you see people, they're probably less harmful. Not as good as not smoking, that would be the ideal. But if you are somehow cannot get off the cigarettes, but you can move to a less harmful product, probably, and the data is not out yet, but the hints are that probably is a little better. And we have, as non-smokers, definitely we've had growing legislation uh, helping us have public places being less exposed to the product. Uh, lung cancer screening, I think, is a big advancement, and maybe over the years we'll see the same impact that breast cancer screen screening has had on survival. Uh, we know we have the tools to curb pollution. We, we just don't have the political will and desire to do so. So, as citizens, yeah, we can influence that. And then I'm going to give you a very little brief treatment hope, which is called immunotherapy. You hear that on TV; they advertise hard, but. This is a case that I was involved in. This is not a lung cancer. It's a melanoma that ended up in the lung. But this is when I met this, this lady. She's in her 80s. And it was a large, and she was at risk of losing the entire lung here. And I said, you know, why don't we give her immunotherapy? She did have the right genes to do so. A year later, after on immunotherapy, she came back, and the tumor was a lot smaller. I could do a much lesser operation. I only took out the bottom half of her lung here instead of the entire lung. And the good news is that the cancer was all dead. The immunotherapy had, cured, had completely killed that big cancer. And that's something we rarely saw before. And Dr. Z is going to tell you more about that. We're seeing a lot more now that we have these new treatments. So that's, that's exciting. So thank you. I think uh, I would suggest that next week you should consider voting more with your lungs than anything else. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. And earlier, uh, your slide, one slide you're talking about 55 to 77 year old to spring. How can, how can you find that lady is already over 77? That's a good question. Now, the reason why those numbers those criteria is because it was the way the trial, the study was designed. Does it mean that you're not going to get a lung cancer if you're 78 or 79? No, it doesn't. Um, but then, right now, that's that's the way that things are. And I think over time, I think the societies and, and the agencies will probably widen those year gaps. But there is definitely some data to show that the highest group at risk is within those age groups. Now, if you're 79 and you smoked for a long time and you want to get screening right now, you cannot go and say, I want to be screened. But there are ways around it. Uh, you can say, I've had a cough, for, and Ben will talk about this, and a cough may prompt an x-ray. Or you can just say, I'm going to pay out of pocket and I will pay for my screen, uh, which is the way they do it in Japan. So there are ways around it, but right now, as far as the criteria are defined, and that's recent, that may change over time. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned the vapor is less risky. How about 
smoking cigar compared to a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> so there's not a lot of data. The, the issue here is most people that smoke cigars don't smoke 25 to 30 cigars a day. Yeah. So it may be that the exposure is a little less. My personal opinion is very simple. Your lungs are not meant to be inhaling hot stuff. They're not. So whether it's cigar, pipe, <clears throat> vaping, marijuana, I don't believe that any of those are healthy for your lungs. Now, do I have the data to say that about marijuana? I don't. Okay? I just don't believe it's good for your lungs. When you see a healthy lung, when you see a, a, a young or a lung from Alaska, they come down here, their lungs, they haven't smoked, their lungs are beautiful, they're pink. Yeah. You, want, you say, it doesn't take a lot for this to become dark and black, and so, no. Anything you throw down your lungs cannot be healthy. That's not, that's not data-driven, that's my own experience, I haven't done that for 25 years. I saw another hand. Can you talk about e-cigarettes? So that's that's part of the this part of these alternatives. So these cigarettes, I believe, are less bad than regular cigarettes, but they're still bad. <laughs> they're less bad, less evil. <laughs> yes. So how about second hand on that? Yeah. We don't have any data on that, but I'm going to follow the same principle. It's not. Now, honestly, though, when you walk next to an e-cigarette smoker, there's a lot of stuff comes out of their mouth, but you don't, you don't smell a lot as much as a, a smoker. And I don't know it's whether or not we don't smell it, or there's actually not as much because it goes up instead of going so I don't know. But I prefer to walk next to an e-cigarette smoker than a regular smoker. My wife knows that. Because um, I walk way around when I see smoke. <laughs> but I cannot believe that it's good for you. I cannot believe that it's good for your lungs. So any time when you see any time when you see smoke, it's a smoke always a very very fine particle like the PM two two point five this kind of particle. Smoke is always a solid particle. Am I right or am I wrong? Well, there are solid particles. Some of it is vapor. Some of it is liquid. Okay. Yeah. So I just wish you were Oscar. <laughs> Depends where in us. <laughs> Listen, we have it good here. We do have it good here. This is not a, a it's, it's not the cleanest, but it's not the dirtiest either. If you look at the entire country. Yes. If you held the primary care position after your speech, if many people walk in the office and want to do those kissing, even if I'm a smoker, how would you say? So that's a very good question. Uh, I would say either you, you have symptoms, and that leads to imaging, or you pay cash. <laughs> <laughs> because most insurance companies right now will restrict the the, the, the screening to the criteria that have been defined by CMS. But about non-smoke, were you were asking about non-smokers or? Yeah, non smoker. Non -smoker. I, listen, I'm a non smoker and I've had a few CAT scans. Uh, listen, I, and then you have to weigh in the two things though. You're getting radiation. You are. So are you when you're flying, Asia or Europe, right? And then your CAT scan may show something that is nothing. You don't have to know about it, but that'll lead you to have a bunch of additional tests and biopsies and complications. So you got to be careful with that. I mean, I cannot, honestly, I cannot go, if you're never a smoker, you should get a, a CAT scan every year. I can't do that. I think it'd be okay to have one here and there. Yeah, because they, we are from Asia. Lots of Asian countries do it. Physical checkup. Yes. And they give very strange Report. So everybody bring those reports back and uh -huh. say, I want to do this. Gotcha. What did you do? And I've seen a lot of patients who had their CAT scan visiting family in Taiwan or mainland, and they bring it back and, whoa, what do we do now? And I've seen that. <laughs> How about the effect of deodorant um, and perfume? <laughs> I was hoping no one would ask me that. <laughs> There's, uh, it's debated. 
there's a very there's no data to strongly support one way or the other. But if you go back to my original thought, which is, it's not healthy to throw things down your lungs. I do. I have concerns. I have some patients, never smokers, hairdressers, and I'm going, eh, maybe, maybe. You know, protect your lungs. That's it. In 70 or 80, all my work in my same office, they are all changed. I can see that they, some of them died already. Yeah. <laughs> how, how can I convince my doctor or the insurance company to have a uh, CT scan or something? Like no. So I can't just do it until it happens. No. I said you can go to the emergency room and say, I have chest pain. <laughs> I can guarantee you they'll do a CAT scan. <laughs> I, that's true, isn't it? You go to any emergency room, you say, I have chest pain, they, they won't even ask you any questions, they'll get you a CAT scan. No. It's, not, it's not a low dose CAT scan. It's not a low dose CAT scan. In fact, it's a CAT scan with contrast. That means a high dose radiation. Be careful. And then, if your CAT scan shows anything, it may lead you to a bunch of additional tests. And that, it's, so it's, it's not as simple. It's not as simple. The risks are low. Is it only CTs or can you get it? Chest x-ray has been shown over and over not to be useful. It's not good enough. Sorry, can you repeat that? Cooking. Yes. Cooking. Yes. So that's a that's a risk factor, and and the solution here is better ventilation and aeration around the cooking area. That's the solution, and I, there's data to show that. A lot of that has come out of, of China. So I have a question on, on the therapy that you mentioned earlier. Uh, you know therapy. What is oh, that? I'm going to let him talk to you oh, about okay. it because he's the expert. <laughs> that, there was another hand, that's, and then we'll move on. Yes. Uh, when you see the nodule on the low dose CAT scan, what's the safest time to observe? Okay, so that's a good question. I, I skipped through this, but there's very well defined guidelines by the, the National Radiology Societies depending on the size of the nodule and how solid the nodule is on, on imaging. Okay, so certain size, you will, over two centimeters immediately, you do more testing. Under two, depending on these other criteria, you'll either do another CAT scan in three months or six months. And these, these uh, criteria have been very well, and they're, they're tweaking it, but they've been very well established. And that's, it's very, a computer can make those decisions for us. Yes? Any relationship with a pneumonia patient cancer? cancer? So there's not, pneumonia does not cause cancer. But this is one of the ways where patients will present, and you're going to talk about that maybe. Hello. So, but that's one of the ways patients with lung cancer present. It's because the, the, there is a pneumonia behind the cancer, and that's how they, they present with their symptoms. And then you treat the pneumonia, the patient feels better, but the tumor, the, the cancer is still there. So we see some of that. But it's not the pneumonia that causes the cancer. Thank you. Um, of course, my slides in Chinese, but I, I just speak English then. I think you're right. So, um, I can speak Mandarin also. I'm in Swedish to the American College. I'm in the Swedish to the American College. I'm in the Swedish to the American College. 还有那个免疫治疗、保障治疗 Eric has talked about the risk factors the number one is 85% people 就要吸烟的话 
职业的接触，比如说 asbestosis， 那主要是 navy 啊 ，insulation 啊，就是这种 ，and you know， 啊 ，is radiation， radiation， this is a air pollution， so 呃、uh, ，in Guangzhou， you know， the air， the traffic cops is they used to stand in the middle of the road and tell which way to go， the average lifespan is fifty years old。So、that's because that's all young men who have these stories, and、uh, less than fifty years old. That's because of the sitting on the fumes or the pollutions. So, yeah, I got consulted many people from mainland. You know, there are a lot of people, young men, women, lung cancer, lost time because of air pollutions、um, in China.、Um, And this is a symptom. That is, what symptom? Is it first one? Is it Eric? Is it cough, cough? No, this is not very common. That every person is cough. You know, that. But at least, you know, you are often cough, or at least two or three weeks. Is it every day cough? 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 Got better a little bit, and then cough came back again. You should do a, you should do a antibiotics. Two rounds antibiotics, not getting better. You probably better off get a get a cat scan. Now this, you must get a, you know, coughing a blood. Cushion, you need. Two should have had any more issue, or just get just shoot it out. Right. You better get a cat scan. Uh, 还有呢，就是 hoarseness， 声音突然就是嗓音变了，或者一般主要嘶哑了，就嗓音变了，主要一般嘶哑，就是跟神经的那个呃，就是呃压迫的。还有呢，就是 chest pain， 呃， can't get breath， 呃，那这 chest pain， 呃，那就是痛一般就一个位置，然后呢经常发生。Uh, you know, the way of saying that, like good things go away, bad things don't. So, 好的东西，这个好像，如果有坏的东西，它有什么问题的话，它它不会走掉的。你就你 better check it out. 那这个是为什么？就是主要是有胸腔有积液的这样子的。呃 ，pleural effusion， 大概就是有 water around the lungs, compressing it. That's why people have pain, get deep breath, and can't breathe, and pain in the chest. As these are localized symptoms, and there's、uh, some people lose weight unintentionally. So they're not trying. Everybody wants to lose weight these days, but if you're not trying, then you lost 15, 20 pounds. It's a problem. Better check it out.、Um, or some bone pain. Everybody has pain here and there. Back pain, hip pain. <laughs> you got, you know, usually about two, three weeks. You know, in one spot, and at nighttime when there's no distraction, you have more pain. You know, and you, you better check it out. You know, so these are not meant to be scare everybody to say, but you know, it's more. I think it's important to remember is. Something's not going away in two or three weeks. In a month,、um, it's about time to get you serious to check it out. We just、uh, too late because my friend said <laughs> 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 speak when he went out last year. Yeah, now he's、yeah. struggling now. Yeah, so that's a good question. Does that it's better off to do the screening? Too late when it's、uh, um, cold and too bright. Right. So these are the things. You're right. So when we have symptoms, usually it's、uh, usually it's it's later stage, stage three or four.、Um, but it's still sooner is better than later. We have a saying that、uh, in stage four,、um, somebody let's say in stage four,、uh, even a week. Can, I didn't do that. <laughs> Even a week can make a difference. So that's what we do. at Swedish. We try to get patient in. You know, you know, within a couple of days, just if somebody having symptoms, lung diagnosed lung, I'm just wanting to get them in. Thinking about you know they are going for chuckling, chuckling, doing a lung, doing okay, and then all of a sudden they're gonna fall through, fall through a cliff. So things happen very quickly. So if Somebody has, you know, that those lung cancer needs to see doctor. Even a week makes a difference. But if most time, no, less early stage breast breast cancer they don't. But stage four lung cancer because all of a sudden you can't breathe and performance stands very bad. Some constipation.
Okay, I have a question about the bone pain. Yeah. Uh, is this more localized uh, related in relationship to like cough and then chest pain, or is the bone pain all over the body? Yeah, usually not all over the body. Most pain is one localized area. So for example, let's say you have a, somebody has a spot over here, it's just not going away in the mouth. Mm -hmm. Most times, still arthritis, but you know, still if the and the pain usually. Uh, worse than your night, no disruption, usually the 24 7. Uh, so these are some of that. So, okay, for uh, so we talk about uh, diagnosis, so the CT scan, the next step is the biopsy. Um, usually, the radiology biopsy. Um, for the pulmonologist, they can assess the lymph node uh, in the tissue. Uh, and then, to answer your question, um, <laughs> the tissue can show us you know, lung, not lung cancer, that's what we all hope for. Um, and then sometimes there's adenocarcinoma, square muscle carcinoma, and a small cell. So, adeno, like a sheer line, a square muscle from the line. So, how you don't shout, cheap on line. Like, the is driving your side now, after the diagnosis, and you do PET scans, MRI, brain, or stages, so or something like that. So, I'll just make it very easy. There's four stages, and then a small cell is separate, and I'll, I'll talk different about that. Uh, stage one, you have a simple spot, one spot, um, no lymph node. Stage two, we have local lymph node, high low lymph node around in the same spot of the lungs. One or two, one a surgeon like Dr. Benares, do um, surgery, take it out, and hopefully that's cured. That's the whole point of screening. You found something smaller, diagnosis cancer, and then cut it out, and hopefully it's cured. Stage three is uh, you either have lymph nodes on the same side, but they are a little bit further away from the, from the spot. There's stage three A or 3D is being found on, on the other side or in the medial side, in the middle side of the chest. Uh, the disease requires a team approach. Mm -hmm. uh, many times, you know, there are three approaches that we have you know, the, uh, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgery. So there are three tools we have. So, what sequence to use? Uh, for example, if you have medial sinus nodes or contralateral, then you probably have chemo radiation together. If you are the same side, you can still do surgery, but you do surgery first, or so there's a tumor radiation first, and then followed by surgery. You need a tumor approach. This is what we do at Swedish. We have a tumor board. A lot of you know, surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, radiology pathologists, yeah. everybody sitting in the room, and we discuss a case, come up with the best approach for that. Uh, stage four is a problem. So basically, you know, the Spreads the bone, the liver, adrenal gland, whatever we can do. Shen Shang you know, Han Zhang, Kumu, 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 So, I briefly talk about, you know, stage one, mm -hmm. so one and two surgery, stage two, uh, stage three is, you know, chemo radiation, sometimes, most times, chemo radiation. Stage four, we're talking about chemotherapy, to your patient, you know, to targeted therapy, which I'll show the next time. And then, uh, yeah, you chill out, that's immunotherapy. And sometimes when their folks are not in good shape, um, we recommend hospice. <coughs> so this is uh, specific to the Chinese population. I have this article from 2016. It's mostly for non-smokers in China. So you can see there's a mutation called EGFR. Actually, about half the patients have EGFR mutations. 40% of patients have no mutations. And then ALK mutation 7.5%, and RET mutation 1.4%. So why I highlight these three? Because EGFR is a gene in the two years. 80% of lung cancer because of smoking. And about 15% of people are not, never smokers, never touch the cigarettes. Some of them you know, don't even have second mass smoke. Why they get cancer? So they have mutations. You know, anyway, gene, you have a 2B actor. Which one to be on? I don't think we know if they're younger. Okay, it's not related to age. But, uh, 
actually more common in you know, age, Asian females, never smokers, uh, folks can have mutations. Um, yes. 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 Target therapy. Yes. Yeah. So, so with EGFR, uh, in the U.S., we use a lot of or Tasiva, and then in China is usually Gifitinib. Um, and then the second generation got a fat and then the third one called So these are uh, different pills that people take. So it's a pill you take once a day. Um, and the response rate is about 70% of people who respond have shrinkage of cancer. Uh, longest person I have, over six years, you know, she's remained on the pill. So, but, that's not the norm. Most people, after a year and a half, a year, um, the pill will stop working. So it's more like, just like the doctor, you should work on each other, so there's more mutations coming. So sometimes there's a T7, T90M mutation, a certain mutation we have, we can give a different kind of pill to overcome that resistance. Uh, but um, there's also, just like the Shuan and Jian, that way sword. Because they have the mutation, uh, they are less likely to respond to immune therapy. Uh, and you should have to use the other one, which is not too much to be able to do it. It's not too much to be able to do it. Because the immune therapy is the same as the cell cell. For example, like the cell cell, the cell cell has a DNA cell. The cell cell has a DNA cell. The cell cell has a DNA cell cell that can recognize it. And then how the immune system works. That's why the melanoma, like skin cancer, skin cancer, ah, these are all very common in the human body. But if this mutation is just one gene mutation, it doesn't recognize it. So you can say, ah, but if you choose one, you still need to choose the mutation. Mutation, because if you eat this drug, you can see, ah, the symptoms will disappear. So these are different alkyls that另外一个基因 mutation 或者另外的一种药，啊，来给它一种 ROS， 就是反正亚洲人当中这个 mutation 很高。那呃 perspective 呢，就是说呃 in the US， 呃 non Asian and non smoker 就是 about five to fifteen percent mutation， 五到十五个。这边我们有百分之四十七的 mutation， 所以就 Chinese population 还是很多的 mutation 几率还比较高的。所以就说四期的话，第就说不管你们西天都要去测测，就是这个基因的测测。现在我们呢，呃，基本上每个人都要，啊，就是 personal medicine program， 每个人基因都会送到那个 foundation 或者什么，都会都会去测基因，就是就不会漏过，就是。那我建议就每个人去，如果是那个方面的测测。然后这个免疫治疗呢，我呃有很多，现在呢有很多那个，呃，呃。你看广告上有很多的 Aldivo 啊、Keytruda 啊、Artecentric 啊，那现在怎么用呢？呃，有很多呃变异的东西啊，就是这个也在经常在变。什么呢？比如说我们测一个呃一个 PDL1， 那就是那个肿瘤细胞呢，我看一个分子的表表达数啊。如果它百分之五十或者很高的话呢，我们就给直接就给 Keytruda， 那时候呢就静脉治疗，每三个星期治疗一次。那有效率呢？差不多百分之四十五的人 ，forty five percent people respond to it alone. So chemo free, just to give it to them. Um, if the PDL one less than fifty percent, the the other one is on. They still need the chemo and immune therapy together. So carbo and the drugs to it. That is to say, you still need chemo and immune therapy together. So there's a lot of ongoing. These are the data as of like right now. That's how we treat it. But there's a lot of new things coming out. Uh, all I can tell you is that there are people who, you know, who give them immune therapy and all the fluid infusion <coughs> goes away, so it might become pretty much all normal. Uh, we have, you know, they don't have the track records of like six years or that long, but the longest I have is uh, maybe a couple of years, so it's not uh, as long, but uh, still there are a few sides. To give you perspective is, um, Carbo permatrix chemotherapy alone, the response rate only one third, 30, 30, 33%. And chemotherapy can reach 50% response rate. So high response rate and less side effects. Um, 
So um, I'll just touch, touch a little thing about small cell lung cancer. That's all we talk about now is squamous carcinoma, adenocarcinoma, or you know, now small cell lung cancer. We have a small, different entity for small cell lung cancer, but she died. Um, only 20% of our lung cancer is small cell. But they treat very differently. Um, so limited stage, meaning that if you can fit into a radiation field, and they got radiation chemo together, and if you can't fit into a radiation field, then we do chemotherapy alone. Immune therapy is only about 19% of people respond to it, so we still give it to folks, but the response rate is much lower. We haven't really figured out the optimal way to use that yet. Um, so I guess uh, what you remember is uh, stop smoking and uh, just because we are never smoker doesn't mean we, well, we don't get lung cancer. Actually, um, that 15% of non-smoker, 15% uh, of lung cancer we never smoke, their absolute number is higher than all the acute leukemias. So actually, it's all like acute AML, ALL. Their absolute number is actually less than people who never smoke cigarettes and got lung cancer. So I think we still need to be vigilant. Uh, uh, um, so Dr. Better has talked about you know, screening. So I'll touch upon that about now smoking getting screening. So I, my mother, uh, we, I'm from Suzhou, right? Uh, so Dr. Suzhou, right now, um, my mother, through her work, um, she never smoked cigarettes. And uh, um, she had a screening CT scan through her work. Uh, she retired, but you know her, her program has a yearly CT scan, and she had a nodule. And so um, every year, you know, before she get a CAT scan, she's very nervous. You know, like, you know, so there's a psychological factor also. The small nodule she's following, and she's taking all kind of traditional Chinese medicine trying to make it go away. <laughs> so, so, so there's a, there's a, I'll say, um, but if you have symptoms, definitely, you know, if you're worried about it, once in a while, I would say. So way to get screened is say you have cough, and nobody can verify you have a cough or not, right? So, um, uh, but certainly if you have any other symptoms, I mentioned severe symptoms, then you should get screened. Just quote, say Dr. Valerest, tell me that. Yes. 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 They keep saying I cannot quit smoking until we find out that he or she has cancer. Yeah. So, so anyway, <laughs> okay. yeah. So um, I think it's a very, very difficult, and not not understandable task, just because it's super hard. Um, we found, uh, you know, for a man, there's a way of, um, you know, you can scare him all he wants, but uh, like people never really see how sick when. People with stage four lung cancer, they can't breathe, can't eat enough air, it's quality, they're struggling. So they never see it. But we found that, at least in, in the paper that I read, that uh, in Canada actually, they on the cigarette boxes, they, they put a man with an impotence on there. And somehow they got their attention. <laughs> so, so there's all kind of like, you know, there's different ways, you know, but I guess. Honest with you, quitting cigarettes is also extremely hard. The success rate is less than 10, 15 percent, right? So maybe I would. Yeah. We uh, so a part of our team, we have uh, four nurse practitioners that went to train at the Mayo Clinic, and it's uh, it's more than just giving him a prescription for nicotine replacement and an antidepressant. There has to be more of a structure. Uh, Vin's right. It's a, it's probably the hardest drug to get rid of uh, to get to get. They manipulate the product so well that it's very hard to get rid of it. But um, our success rate is actually, uh, we're going to write it up, is actually very high on one year. And it's not because, it, it has to do with the structure, and it's not just one moment. There is recall, there is support, and if you don't want to quit, it doesn't matter where you go, it's not going to work. You need the patient, the person needs to be convinced that he or she wants to quit. And, but it's hard, it's really hard. The person that taught me the most in my training, a surgeon, he was a world-renowned lung cancer surgeon. He died of lung cancer at 64. He was a two-pack per day smoker. He was he was giving talks like the one I knew. 
he was very intelligent. He was addicted to the product. It's very hard. Okay, well, we have a Papato company that's making product. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's really, I mean. Both with your lungs. Yeah. I, I, I think um, from what I see, it's just uh, folks really struggle with the values. So stay away from that. But once they touch it, there are so many things bad in the world, and it's hard to do. Uh, yes. I know the youth are doing Alaska. 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 You know, we have uh, uh, well, yeah, we actually have a very strong affiliation yeah. with um, with Seattle a naturopathic medicine group, who have three providers now who have all specialized in cancer care, uh, and so it's really important if you're going to be doing complementary care like that that you're working with a naturopath who actually has a specialty in cancer. Oh. Because it's very common for people to do things at cross purposes, right? And you don't want to be going and getting a chemotherapy that is heavily reliant on these oxidizing agents, but then you're taking high dose antioxidizing agents by a well intentioned naturopath who doesn't understand your cancer. So we actually have three, um, we have uh, in each of our campuses have naturopaths on site that will meet with patients. And very important for things like menopausal symptoms during breast cancer treatment, um, weight gain, <coughs> nutrition, uh, general health, insomnia, mental health, um, a lot of the concerns that our patients have during all of our cancer treatments and the side effects of treatments can really be um, made better. So I think that's a very important point. And we're gradually, we're way behind, you know, we're about five, 10,000 years behind in this country, but we're getting there. <laughs> 自己大家了解了,在美國現在是中西醫聯合治療,因為我知道我們台灣是中西醫對的,其實這裡是中西醫大家聯合。有很多東西,比如說Acupuncture helps a lot, and then neuropathy is an immediate, and there's different ways to help people with their appetite, so the love in their appetite. You mentioned about your mother, um, when she comes to bed, has that been helpful to her or no? Oh, you can't argue with your mother, we always say yes. <laughs> 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 this, uh, from the doctor's point of view. Oh, she, oh my mother's very strong-minded. She'll, she'll, she'll make find all kind of evidence to support her. All I can say is yes. Another thing that uh, the other doctor says mentioned about insomnia. So is that a lack of sleep going to affect your chance of um, getting cancer? We're, we're learning a lot about sleep in the brain, and um, some of the best data now are both in the connection of poor sleep and poor sleep hygiene with cancer and with dementia. Um, so it's actually something that's getting a lot of attention now. It's a very difficult, difficult thing to study, unfortunately. And so it'll be a long time before we get some of the data. It's a lot harder to study that than it is to study a chemotherapy drug, if you believe it. Um, so, but it's very important for my degrees. And the other thing I would say about complementary medicine, first of all, I can tell you that Dr. Xi's mother and wife are always right. I've heard that many, many times. <laughs> but, but the bottom line is that it's, there are a lot of things that people believe in or that make them feel better um, from the standpoint of holistic approaches um, and traditional approaches. As long as it's causing no harm and it's not stopping my patients from getting the other treatment that will clearly benefit them. So as long as it's not an instead of, as long as it's an along with, then I completely support it. So, uh, yes. So for the National Health and Complementary Medicine, the National Cancer Institute and also Memorial Sloan Kettering both have a very excellent website. 
listing many of the materials uh, better than Google, I think. That just has articles of the study. Yeah, it's uh, very well. Very well. And, uh, we designed the website. Yes. I know you are all um, experts in uh, the cancer part. So is there any chance of uh, you know having some other experts on, about the insomnia you know, come over here to talk to us? <laughs> what we can do to uh, have a better night of love uh, and sleep? If you have other areas of interest, I can connect um, with your group here and we can, we can coordinate that. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 因为今天来的人超过预期 uh,